The Norwood UFO situation is an outstanding series of ten visual sightings of an unidentified flying object. Events that took place in or near the Norwood, Ohio area from August 19th of 1949 until March 10th of 1950. The alleged observation of a massive object by searchlight operator Donald R. Berger, and meticulously detailed in his logs, remain one of the more curious events in UFO history. The words free entertainment and fun for a nickel were the headlines found in Cincinnati area newspapers announcing the Jitney Carnival of 1949 at the St. Peter and Paul Church on Drex Avenue in Norwood, Ohio. The church had rented an 800 million candle power searchlight from an army surplus depot. Its beam strolled through the dark mid-August night skies, hoping to seduce the public to attend the festive gala. Army Sergeant Donald R. Berger was on hand to operate the powerful searchlight for the church festival. Berger later recorded in his logs that he picked up a space platform. The following morning, those attending the festival in Norwood would learn that the entire Cincinnati area had also been visited by comets and fireballs. The case is exceptional not simply due to the dramatic nature of the events, but due to the high caliber of persons involved. The series of incidents were witnessed by civilians, by clergy, by scientists, by police officers, and by military officials. It made a, like I said, sort of made a believer out of me, but I didn't post about it because, you know, a lot of people think you're cuckoo when you talk about flying saucers, but uh, I didn't know what, what it was, and I still don't know what it was, but it was something. It was something. The Norwood UFO situation is an outstanding series of ten visual sightings of an unidentified flying object, events that took place in or near the Norwood, Ohio area from August 19th of 1949 until March 10th of 1950. We not only have a full-blown mystery in the skies above Norwood, but now have what seems to be an interesting cabal of noted observers plotting and purposefully seeking to lure the strange object into the searchlight beam on the Norwood grounds. The photos and movie film of the Norwood object make this case a most compelling one. The photos taken by Norwood Police Sergeant Leo Davidson were kept in the files at the Norwood Police Department until some time in the mid-80s when they were last seen at a Norwood Kiwanis Club meeting. The motion picture film was last seen in the possession of Reverend Gregory Miller and shown to an eager crowd at WCPO Channel 9 News in Cincinnati. The information contained on those photos is shocking, and analysis of the frame grabs by present-day computer methods are quite revealing. This startling event must not be lost to history. This documentary is an effort to preserve the strange but true account of a tremendous and unidentified object seen in the skies over Norwood, Ohio in 1949. To this day, the authenticity of the UFO situation is unacknowledged by our military and elected officials. If movement towards official UFO disclosure might someday take place for some future generation, perhaps the important details of what happened at Norwood in 1949 will finally be realized. So what I'm going to talk about here real quickly, and I'm going to try to go through this as fast as I can because we've got a lot of stuff on the agenda here today. The uh, Norwood incident from 1949. Uh, uh, what is the Norwood incident? Uh, that is 10 visual sightings of a UFO from August of 49 to March of 1950 that took place in the grounds of the St. Peter and Paul uh, church in Norwood. This is a uh, image of um, Norwood in 1949. The first event took place on August 19th, and this was the uh, Jitney Carnival of 1949. At the time, there were literally thousands of witnesses to this event. It was seen by, a, it was picked up by a searchlight that was uh, used to promote the church festival. This is a uh, image of the church in uh, 1949. Today it's called Holy Trinity. I don't know if anybody in here is familiar with Norwood or not. <laughs> this is the uh, searchlight that was used. It was actually uh, operated by Army Sergeant 
Donald R. Berger. And he was hired by the church pastor, Reverend Gregory Miller, to operate the searchlight. He kept detailed logs of each sighting. And um, the August 19th event was the first uh, situation that triggered his interest. And uh, as I said, it was something that was literally seen by thousands. It wasn't simply something that took place at the festival. This was a situation that was witnessed all across Cincinnati and a large part of southern Ohio. Here's one article from the Cincinnati Times Star. Um, another article from the Cincinnati Post. Strange lights reported in sky. Um, one thing about this was the various terms used to describe the object of the August 19th event. Um, they described it as strange lights, stationary bodies of white light, an object resembling a weather ceiling balloon that did not move despite wind speed, comets poised over city. Uh, I thought this was uh, some comical reportage that was given in the Cincinnati Enquirer. Um, all three papers covered this event locally, so it was something that was picked up in the media at the time. Uh, Reverend Gregory Miller, the church pastor, entered into an agreement with the uh, Cincinnati Post managing editor Robert Lynn to report this to intelligence officials at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton. So they were impressed by this. I don't think this is simply a case of... Uh, of uh, searchlights bouncing off of clouds that had people concerned. They were saying there was a solid physical object there. Um, Berger re reported in his logs that he picked up a space platform. Uh, so I thought that was very curious. And what would uh, what would intrigue someone to write that? You know, what exactly he saw is is really incredible. But the description we have of what happened on August 19th. It was a massive object. It was an outstanding sighting that took place locally here in Cincinnati. Uh, the second event happened on September 11th of 1949. Um, this also happened at another church festival locally in Madeira, Ohio. Donald R. Berger took his, uh, his large military-grade searchlight to uh, that church festival, and there he picked up the UFO. I also understand recently... We've located newspaper articles in the um, Coshocton Tribune of Coshocton, Ohio, and also the Lima, Ohio newspaper carried articles about the sighting from September 11th. Uh, again, the next event, September 17th, Donald R. Berger, the searchlight operator, he finds a UFO he writes while testing his searchlight at a Army surplus depot in Milford, Ohio. This event takes place around around us. Uh, object is not self-luminous, and that, and, and which means that uh, it was not visible unless he was able to project the searchlight directly on it. This is the big event, October 23rd of 1949. Uh, a gathering of 50 people, curiously, in the rear parking lot of the St. Peter and Paul Church in Norwood. They observed the strange object between 7.15 and 10.45 p.m. I got this article from the Cincinnati Post the following day. The October 23rd event was very significant. It happened on the uh, in the rear parking lot of the church. Uh, present were notable people, Reverend uh, Cletus Miller, the brother of Gregory Miller, who was also present. Uh, Berger, of course, running the searchlight. Norwood Police Officer Leo Davidson and scientist William Winkler of Winkler Color Services uh, was present. Also was uh, Cincinnati Post. Uh, reporter Leo Hurdle and managing editor uh, Robert Lynn. And here is what's very curious about the October 23rd affair. An unidentified astronomer was reported in this newspaper article as being questioned by the military regarding his observation of the object of October 23rd. This object was said to discharge Numerous smaller objects that were triangular shaped. The Reverend Cletus Miller described them as resembling something like the apex of Indian arrowheads. Uh, this was a dramatic sighting. It was a massive object. Um, there were a very curious series of flashes that preceded each projection of smaller objects from the main object. 
Reportedly, fighter planes were scrambled but could not reach the altitude of the UFO. And this was reported by um, Leonard Stringfield, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, I know Pete Hardinger is really interested in some of what Leonard Stringfield reported about that, and we'll talk about that here. Um, the object of October 23rd was also photographed, and it was f uh, filmed uh, by Norwood Police Department. This is a photograph of the Norwood object. I wish we had better clarity here on the screen, but we're going to get some enlargements here. It looks like some kind of a... Uh, it doesn't look like what you would expect a conventional image of a flying saucer to look like. Pete, I think in that book you've got there, you've got some images that are identical to this. And what we're going to do here in a little bit, we're going to take some, uh, we're going to take these images and we're going to analyze them. But uh, also present in Norwood at the time of the event was uh, Paul Cook. He's a local resident. He was six years old at the time of the its incident. He said the uh, to turn the searchlight off by military people that drove onto the church lot in a jeep. Also, uh, in researching some of this, I went to the uh, library and I pulled this article. From the following morning's newspaper, Mock Battle Fought, High Over Cincinnati by Two Air National Guard Groups. I thought that was curious, given that uh, this dramatic event had taken place from the day before. Uh, also, on uh, on the, the next day, October 24th, Berger activates his searchlight, and boom, immediately upon turning the light on, the object is visible in the exact same place it was the night before. This is not only recorded in Berger's logs, but we also had obtained this statement from a person that we'll talk about later. Also present on October 24th was Air Technical uh, Intelligence Agent Lou Gerhardt, as per the Berger logs. On November the 19th, again, another incident happened. Operating searchlight uh, again on the Norwood grounds. For whatever reason, we do not know right right now. Berger spots the object at 7.15 p.m. Many many witnesses were present. Uh, December 20th, this is a very significant occurrence taking place on the church grounds. From 8.15 p.m. to 10 o'clock at night, um, the UFO is visible in the searchlight beam. This is something to watch now. Present are UC physicist Dr. Dare A. Wells uh, and noted astronomer Professor Paul Hergett. Now, we, we know from the October 23rd incident there was an astronomer present. We don't know his name. He was an unnamed person, but it's possible, given that Herget was listed as being there on the 20th, this could be him. <coughs> this is the uh, mayor of Norwood at the time, Ed Tepe. He had told uh, uh, several years after the incident that Herget and Wells worked closely with two Air Force Office of Special Investigation Agents to observe the UFO, measuring its size and distance. It was said to be 10,000 feet in diameter at an estimated elevation of 10 miles up. Uh, Tepe made his comments to Leonard Stringfield in 1954. This is uh, Dr. D.A. Wells. He was quoted later as saying, in my opinion, it's an optical illusion. This is uh, astronomer Professor Paul Herget. And uh, he said, also in the same article, it may be a fake. Or he said, no, I'm sorry, he said it's not a fake. It may be caused by the illumination of gas in the atmosphere. Uh, Herget collected data on minor planets. He, uh, he uh, went on to work in the U.S. space program. And he was critical of UFO reports, and he dismissed the topic altogether. Um, Stringfield interviewed Herget in 1956, and the first thing Herget said to Stringfield when he walked in the room, do you have a security clearance? And Herget said no, or uh, Stringfield said no, I do, my research is strictly civilian. And Herget said, I take a dim view on the subject, there's absolutely nothing to it. Herget, uh, like I say, he was very critical of UFOs. I've got some interesting quotes of, uh, by Herget, um, on the subject. Um, the sightings continued in Norwood, happening on January 11th, March 9th, and again on March 10th of 1950. Present during each occurrence 
were notable uh, high caliber witnesses, police officers, military observers, uh, scientists, clergy. And the event again made news on the uh, April 6, 1950. It made the front page of the Cincinnati Post. And there you see the, uh, the headline article. So this is not something that was, uh, you know, low key. This, this was saturating the news media back in 1949. But my question is, what happened to Donald R. Berger after 19, uh, after the April 6, 1950 news article? Boom. He's off the scene. We've lost track of him. I've even talked to private detectives and, uh, you know, and, and a lot of uh, researchers to try to locate this person. No luck so far to find out what happened to him, to, to talk to his family, what, you know, what would his family say that this person knew. Uh, okay, so from here now, what I want to try to do real quickly before I wrap this up is just to go through the timeline of events that happened after Norwood. There's no movement on the case. For several years, um, the case has lost its identity. Uh, around this time frame, local researcher Leonard Stringfield began taking an interest in UFOs. And in 1952, he appeared on Channel 9 WCPO uh, with the Reverend Gregory Miller. And that's where he met uh, Miller. And he also obtained a copy of the Burger Logs. And he saw the Norwood film at the studio. They rolled the, uh, the film through a projector and watched it. Um, 1954, Stringfield interviews uh, the Norwood mayor, Ed Tepe. And he, f he publishes his first edition of the Crypho Orbit newsletter. Uh, in July of 54, Strangfield makes his first reference to the Norwood case in his uh, newsletter, and it lists anonymously Reverend Miller as a clergyman who is well-known in Cincinnati and who owns a reel of authentic film showing a hovering UFO. Uh, and by the time of the August 6th newsletter, he finally makes his first detailed reference to the Norwood incident, and he publishes the Burger Logs at that time. Uh, no more movement on the Norwood story till 56. Her, or I'm sorry, uh, Stringfield makes another reference to the Norwood case. Here's a very interesting quote in, from Stringfield's newsletter. Giant satellites approximating 10,000 feet in diameter, such as the one that hovered over Cincinnati in 49 and 50, could be used for long periods and be wholly independent. Like the parent craft over Cincinnati, each could carry its brood of smaller devices. 1957, Max B. Miller publishes a book and makes reference to the Norwood case. Uh, also in 57, the book Saucer Post 30 Blue. Stringfield publishes that book and he makes reference to Norwood. Uh, in June of 57, uh, Norwood Mayor is killed in an automobile accident. In 1959, January, Reverend Gregory Miller, he dies of an illness. Uh, in 62, uh, Cletus Miller is the subject of a bizarre extortion plot. I don't think any of this is related to Norwood, but I'm just tracking the participants. Uh, Cletus Miller, it's important to track his, his uh, activity because the possessions of Miller, uh, Gregory Miller, were left to his family. Cletus Miller may have been the recipient of the movie film of the Norwood object. Uh, there were reports additionally that the Norwood object was seen at other festivals happening in the 60s. I've talked to two people about this. I don't know about these reports. I'm a little dubious of them. Perhaps people are equating things to the 1949 events, but I don't know. Uh, in 76, Cletus Miller dies. His belongings are left to uh, his nephew, Dominic Citrullo. I contacted Dominic Citrullo about two years ago. He lives in Florida now. He told me he believes all of this material was confiscated by the government. Very curious. In 77, Leonard Stringfield publishes his book, Situation Read the UFO Siege, and again makes reference to Norwood. Professor Paul Hergett, he dies in 1981. In 1985, the Norwood photos are reportedly shown at a Norwood Kiwanis Club meeting by several police officers who enter the meeting and pass the photos around from a manila envelope to the um, people attending the meeting. In 93, uh, there is an attempt made to, to locate the Norwood uh, UFO photos at the police department. Um, reportedly, 
a file is found at the department marked UFO, but there's nothing in the file. In 94, uh, Leonard Strangfield dies. His uh, files and case data are retained by the immediate family. We don't know if there are any additional details about the Norwood object or negatives of the photos in his files. This is the Holy Trinity Church. It's now called Holy Trinity. At the time it was St. Peter and Paul. If if anybody in here is aware of this, they have been holding um, visionary meetings. And I say visionary, people who look for Mother Mary. They hold these uh, meetings and they draw crowds of thousands of people. And it just so happens to be at the very same location of the uh, Norwood Searchlight Incident. So uh, for what that's worth. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I've been to those. Uh-huh. I've been to the... Uh... What, the sightings? Uh, yes. Anyway, the light, uh, it's like lightning. Uh-huh. And she, Mary said she's going to come with her lights. And all this light just keeps coming and coming. I've got the whole, yes. it's in the Norwood um, Kennedy Center right next to it. Mm -hmm. It's something else. I got, you know, that, you know. Well, they draw thousands of people. It's yeah. really remarkable. And right at the stroke of midnight, yeah. everybody aims their camera at the church building and they flash their light bulbs. Yeah, but and that's that's. You think it's the flash? Well, I, I yeah, I I, I videotaped it, it one time, funny. and and so the the people of faith are looking at that and they're seeing various things. Uh huh. And most of the uh, the gatherings are really uh, undertaken because of a few anonymous people locally who claim Mother Mary sightings and encounters. Uh, in November of 1996, uh, the Norwood story was the focus of a, um, a telling program produced by Bob Leibold of Natural Life Productions. We have Bob here behind the camera. Appreciate him showing up. Um, we devoted a full hour to the uh, discussion of the Norwood story. In 1999, a book CE5 by Richard Haynes is published, and it uh, also talks about Norwood. CE5 stands for Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, uh, in which reportedly a UFO will respond to human-initiated contact. And the, the working theory is the Norwood story is a case in which uh, the searchlight used by the searchlight operator was... Um, interacting with this UFO and somehow, yes, sir. This is eerily like the uh, Thomas Vattel incident. I'm not familiar with that. The one with the um, the pilot went up the extreme altitude after a uh, flying saucer that was well, the flying object was just uh, seen over in Kentucky, yeah. and uh, the mm -hmm. inventions were roughly the same. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to wrap this up here real quick. Then, spring of 2002, um, again, this is, I, I said this earlier, but I'll repeat it here real quickly. I, lo I located Dominic Citrullo in Florida. He said the material was confiscated by the government. He, his, his comments are important because he's the closest surviving relative of, uh, of the Millers. Uh, in March of 2002, we located a new witness to the Norwood story. His name was Arthur Vieser, located by Donnie Blessing. Uh, Great detective working tracking this person down. He told us he was present on August 24th. Uh, he confirmed a lot of the burger log because he basically said, boom, the object was visible right when he turned on the light in the same place it was the night before. He went on camera with his comment. November of uh, last year, a major development. A new photograph is found. A new photo of the Norwood object, which shows a very peculiar oddity here. If you'll see the searchlight beam... Wow. Bends and it's got a little spike in it. It's almost like the light's being sucked right toward the object. The photo was found in possession of a researcher, Ray Stanford of College Park, Maryland. Uh, the crook in the searchlight beam may represent some kind of a, a physics anomaly. We see, we see examples of light bending in science and in photography. Uh, analysis of this does suggest that this is not simply a case of a searchlight bouncing off a cloud nearby, causing the appearance of a bend. Can I say something? We yes. Found that gravity can bend the gravity way to bend light. Well, that's yeah. Like I say, we see this in photography and in science. We see that this can happen. It's plausible.
But it, but this, but the theory is that it's such a massive object that somehow it's it's bending light right toward it. And as you can see, it's very strange. We're going to also show you some more pictures here in a minute. Uh, breaking news here. October 2003, we've had a major, major development in Norwood. A uh, officer with the 123rd Aircraft Control and Warning Squadron was located locally in Cincinnati. He was not familiar with the Norwood story. He told us that he received uh, back in 49 when the the unit was headquarters at Lunkin Field in Cincinnati. They received a call from headquarters to check radar for a massive object over Norwood. They said they, they confirmed it on radar and they watched it for several months over Norwood. Uh, I, I, like I said, I consider this a major development because it's, it's, it's a name. It's a unit. It gives us something to go on. Um, he, the gentleman said that um, smaller objects were also seen on radar coming from the main object. The object finally departed by leaving the scene at a terrible speed, bolting straight out into space. If only Leonard Stringfield could have heard this testimony, he would have been very intrigued by this. The gentleman said that his entire unit was told to keep quiet about this and not discuss it with anyone. Uh, this puts a new focus now on the 123rd Aircraft Control and Warning Squadron. Okay, now here's what I was telling you about. Some of the photos of the Norwood object we're going to analyze real quickly. Uh, there's a close-up of it. It's uh, We did some uh, filtering of the main image, some analysis of it. Uh, the surface uh, has what seems to be things like cratering, ridges. Uh, it's not your typical flying saucer out of close encounters of the third kind. It looks more like a uh, some kind of a, a asteroid, for for lack of a better word. It's very curious. Yes. You go back to to. Um, I want to try it on this thing. That's okay, the, I'll try it with this. If you take a donut, if you take a layer. <coughs> The magnetic fields around an object, you keep on going around, sooner or later you have like a donut effect. A hole at the top and or at the bottom. The light could be hitting the one side, and you're seeing the other side as a shadow. You're seeing as a donut, or these, this, the moisture, there you go. Okay. I certainly don't have any answers, I'll tell you that. Uh, just out of uh, curiosity, I, I sent this to a few people by email. I sent one to Bill Jones here about the uh, the NASA's Cassini space probe took photographs of Saturn's moon uh, Phoebe earlier this week. If anybody saw this on the news, just a little curiosity here. I put the two images side by side. I found a lot of striking uh, similarity in the detail. Do you see the little uh, the little outcroppings on each side are almost the very same point on both images. Of course, uh, we're not suggesting anything, of course, because for that matter, the Death Star that Darth Vader uh, drove around in looks a lot like another Saturn moon, Mimas. So anyway, uh, the case data suggests that this is more than just a UFO sighting. I believe that this is, um, indicates something that a government military operation was, was there in Norwood to evaluate and interact with the UFO. Uh, we do not have crucial evidence in this case. We have received testimony that the government has worked to silence the witnesses. Norwood is not a conspiracy theory. I call it a conspiracy fact because I believe that a lot of our research and documentation can establish this. Working on the base... I'm sorry, Pete, go ahead. Hey, if you check on that unit's history... Well, that's what I was just fixing to get into. Right here is what... what, what our focus right now is uh, through freedom of information. What this gentleman has given us is names to go on. So we're tracking down that unit, the 123rd. I have launched a, a number of FOIA requests... A lot of those are pending. I've been stonewalled by a whole bunch of them so far. Uh, we have had recently some 
press, if anybody saw this in the newspaper, are trying to uh, make the last call for witnesses to this event. I don't believe witnesses are going to be around too much longer because it's a 55-year-old event. So if we're going to get any critical information, we're going to do it fast. Was there any, uh, uh, in the newspaper, people send in uh, letters to the editor? Is there anything in that section? Talk, letters to the editor, talk about it, or? Mm -hmm. uh, Kenny? Yes. The correlation you may have already heard about Rick John Fuller's case. It was around 1989, I think, the Lake Erie. The officer told the ice, they heard the ice cracking and that. The East Lake case. The smaller train chased past the gate. Yeah. In 1984, I actually had a photograph of part of the train. So you mentioned that train was coming out. I thought about that case. Well, there's a lot, I've, I've noticed there's also, there's a lot of stories about trying where objects come from a larger object. I've, yeah. I've read a lot of those. This is back in 1989. What is the most active move on your website? Uh, well, we have the Ohio move on. There's, um, actually, a bill. <coughs> There is an international website too, is there? Well, Utah has their own website. Yeah, no fun. Right? <laughs> right, and each state has their own website. So it depends if you live in Ohio, then you want to go to the Ohio website or Kentucky, you go to the Kentucky MUFON website. There's a national one that have links to all the other ones that you will go to. Yeah, the yeah, website. right. You can do that. If you go to the national one, you can have links to all of them. And, yes. Uh, Kenny? Yes. Kenny, as speculation, why Norwood? <laughs> I like to think that at the time, you have to realize these searchlights are bright. This was a military style searchlight they were using for advertising. The searchlights they use now are not half as bright as these were back then. And who knows? I'm just speculating. What if there was something out there? Maybe it's saw the searchlight. I don't know. I, I really should go and. What's going on right, Patterson? Not to my knowledge. Yes. I don't know. Do you know, Kenny, if this was the same searchlight in the days Probably was, I think. Just want to excavate that searchlight. Well, thank you, everybody. That's that's my uh, take on Norwood. Let's give him a big round of applause.